Uh, well, as I mentioned uh, before we opened up, um, and I've been saying this for the last few weeks, but I always look forward to this sermon series to start off for a year, and this particular next few weeks, uh, I'm just kind of like bubbling over. And to be honest, I'm a bit frustrated because when I'm writing up my sermons, I'm going, I, I can't fit everything I want to say, so then I just push it to the next sermon. And um, there's just so much that I'm excited about for my own personal life, and I just, I want this all for all of it, for all of us. And so today, as we go into this, we're going to be looking at, um, we're going to be looking loosely at just meditating on the Word and how, the, kind of the how-tos. Pastor Tyler walked through last week, what is the Word of God? What is it to be for us? Today's going to be more practical. Uh, how do we apply the Word of God? How do we uh, utilize God's Word to enjoy Him, to be with Him, to have fellowship with Him, not just check off a box, but really how do we use the Word of God that has been given to us to really spend time with the Lord? Now, today is going to maybe be a little bit of a reality check for some of us, maybe a little bit of a gut punch. Uh, you might want to push back on me a little bit, but don't worry because I've been pushing back on myself for the last like couple months. Uh, I just I want you to know that as we go through this today, um, I say this a lot, but i Always mean it every time, but I am preaching this to myself today. Uh, I am right here with you guys as I go through this sermon. There's going to be some stuff that's going to be maybe convicting, maybe you're, you're just going to want to argue back in your mind. That's okay. I'm, I'm, I've been arguing with myself over this a lot too. So this is, none of this is going to meant to be any kind of uh, you know, guilt kind of thing because I am right here with you. I'm in this boat with you as we go through this. So uh, before we look at some of these practical things, I just I want to I want you guys to kind of call out uh, just some. You don't have to confess your own personal sin. You can confess your spouse's sin here. Uh, <laughs> what are the reasons why we don't spend as much time in the Word as we would like or as we think? What are some of the reasons? TV. What else? Busyness. Television. What else? Distraction. Children. Those pesky children. Lord, it's the children you gave me. <laughs> what was over here? Pride. Pride. Ooh, ooh, got into the root already. <laughs> that was for later in the sermon. <laughs> Anything else? Laziness. Okay. What was that? No priorities. All right. Well, you guys got some good ones. <laughs> what was that? Procrastination. All right. So we, time, procrastination, distractions. Um, how about uh, sometimes it's kind of boring? I mean, we don't want to admit that, right? But sometimes, or, or we don't understand what's going on, right? Something like that. We just don't get it. Uh, maybe, how about, um, I, just don't, I just don't really get anything out of it, right? You go and you spend your time. I just didn't really, I didn't feel anything right there. So busyness, all these different things. We live in a very fast-paced society, very frenetic society. Uh, busy has been the new I'm good for probably 10, 15 years, right? Hey, how are you guys doing? Oh, busy, right? That's our way of saying I'm good because busy means I'm important. Busy means people need me. Busy means I'm, I'm popular. I'm being asked to do things. I've got a lot of responsibilities. So that's what busy communicates these days. I'm good because I'm needed and I've got a lot of stuff to do because I'm important. And we've come to expect and really accept this to be normal, right? This busy thing we're doing, this going all over the place, our mind racing, our minds always in 10 different places. We totally accept that as this is normal. And actually, if you're not busy, you're probably doing something wrong. You're either lazy or no one wants to hang out with you. <laughs> something like if someone has time on their hands, you're going, what is wrong with that person? They don't do anything. I mean, we, we look down upon that. But listen to this. So this is C.S. Lewis's spiritual mentor, which that's a cool title. Like, what, what do you do? I'm, I'm C.S. Lewis's spiritual mentor. Yeah, he said this, hurry and busy is the enemy of spiritual growth. It's the death of prayer, and it only spoils our work. It never advances it. Being hurried, being busy, never helps your spiritual life, ever, ever, ever. Haste truly makes waste. And I think haste probably makes the most waste out of our spiritual growth. We try to do everything in haste and fast and little tidbits and, and it just, it does not work. Hurry kills 
relationships. Hurry kills love. Hurry kills intimacy. Hurry kills wisdom. You can't get wise and grow in wisdom in a hurry just by kind of scanning things, reading things real fast. No, it, hurry and busyness, it, it destroys so much of what we want in our lives. Real depth in a relationship, in a marriage, with friends, with kids, with the Lord, real depth takes time. It takes focus. It takes undivided attention, not distracted attention. So, so let me just first say then, before I pray and we look at the text today, when it comes to our time with Jesus, our time in the Word, either the Bible's the problem or we're the problem. I think that, is that, is that fair? Right? Either there's something wrong with the Word, it's boring, it's too long, it doesn't make sense. Either something's wrong with the Bible or something's wrong with us. I'm going to lobby for that second one. All right, so let's pray. And we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 14, but let's pray, ask the Lord to lead us and guide us today. Um, the Holy Spirit would lead us into truth, give us conviction, but conviction that leads to Jesus, not conviction that leads to condemnation and guilt and shame. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for bringing us here. We get to start our week with you, start our week with our friends, our family. We love this design that you have for your church, for your body, for your bride, and God, we are going to be in your word today, and we just we want to see things in your word that maybe we didn't see before, that would bring life to our souls, that would maybe it's going to bring some conviction, but I, I'm hoping, Lord, that your spirit would lead us to life and an excitement for the potential of growing deeper and more vibrant with you. I, I think I can probably speak for every believer in this room to say that we all want more of you. We want to, to know you and know your presence more. We want to be more obsessed with you. But I, I'm hoping that we would be willing to uh, receive maybe some things that might be a little hard to hear, but if we're saying we want this, that we'd be willing to do what we need to do. So help us. We need your help. We're all in this boat together as weak humans, and we needed the help of the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. So Holy Spirit, would you do that? Lead us into your truth today as we open up your word. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. So Ephesians chapter 3, uh, we're going to start in verse 14. Paul had just got done talking about the mystery of the gospel that he received, and now he's delivering the gospel to the church and so here's what he says in verse 14. So for this reason, for this gospel reason we have, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, according to the riches of God's glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Let's read that again according to the riches of his glory. Okay, so, so not something you have to muster up, right? I don't have to muster up this love and passion for the word, and I just, I just gotta muster up this love for prayer. Somehow I gotta create it in my inner being. That's not where it comes from. It doesn't come from hyping yourself up. According to the riches of his glory. This, this change you want doesn't come from you. It comes from the riches of his glory, All right? So we gotta figure out how to tap into the riches of his glory. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant to you, so give you as a gift, again, not something you create, not something you muster up, he would grant you to be strengthened, I want to be strengthened, with power through his spirit in where in our inner being. I mean, do you want that? I want that. That sentence right there, I'm going, wait, strengthened with power through the spirit in my inner being? Like, my inner being is my biggest problem in life. Right? I mean, this thing in here, this has problems. I want to be strengthened with power through the Spirit in my inner being. So I got to ask myself, do I want that? Because he's offering it to me. He's made it available. Do I want it? Now, the purpose of all this, to be strengthened, purpose is this, so that 
Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Church, I want this. I want this. The purpose of being strengthened by the Spirit is so that we would enjoy fellowship with Jesus. To have him fill us. We would have our, uh, Christ may dwell in our hearts, live in our hearts, dwelling in us. So that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is, this is a key verse here, the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You can be filled with all the fullness of God. This is, being, this is being granted to you according to not how good your faith is, not how strong your faith is, not how much you pray, not how much you read the Bible, but according to the riches of his glory. That's where that comes from. Now to him, gets better. <laughs> to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think. Because think about this. If your depth of faith was up to you, that, that's just not good news not good news. This inner being can't muster up a whole lot of faith. But Christ is able to do far more abundantly than all I ask or think. Again, according not to the power that I have, but the power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So church, he is able to do far more abundantly than you even know is possible in your life in Christ. Wherever you're at right now in Christ, it can get so much better, so much deeper, so much more vibrant, so much more alive. That is available to you. And it's not something you create. It's, the pressure is not on you to create this thing. This is according to the glory of God. So ask yourself again, do you want that? Do you want that? And last week, Pastor Tyler, I said, did a, did a fantastic job bringing so many great truths about God's word being our light, our bread, our water, reminding us that we wouldn't dare go without those things. We wouldn't go without bread and water, but we would go to them every day. We want our food. We want our water. Our lives depend on those things. That's exactly why God refers to his word using those three things that he created, light, food, water. Now, unfortunately for us, we're in a hurry. We're in a hurry. We're rushed. We're busy. We're scattered, we're distracted. And rather than sitting down at a, at a meal, a feast before the Lord, the table that he sets for us, rather than sitting down at that meal, we, we say, oh, I'll be fine, I, I'm, I'm good, I got this. We either skip our meal, we skip our time with the Lord, or at best, maybe we get some crumbs. Usually what we do, though, is we just kind of microwave a few spiritual Pop-Tarts for nutrition as we just run out the door. You know, we, we wake up, we just we, we check our email, we check our messages, the news, social media, we shower, we brush our teeth, we get our coffee, we do all those other things. But we skip the most important meal, which is our time with the Lord, feasting on God's word. We don't go to the daily bread. And why is it? Well, because we're bored, we're in a hurry, we're distracted, the kids, the, the kids, the kids. <laughs> Sorry, kids. We love you, kids. But there's, there's real things that, that come into our life. There's real roadblocks. And there's also some roadblocks, though, that maybe we're kind of, we can probably remove some. There's probably some adjustments we can make. The word says that we're naked, poor, wretched, and blind, but we walk out of the house as if, as if we're, we're fine. We're fine. We got this. We, we truly, deep down, our, our actions show we don't want to be strengthened with power through his spirit in our inner being because we feel okay, or at least we feel good enough. I'm good enough. I can do this in my own strength. But Paul says here, back in verse 16, according to the rich of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So two weeks ago, I mentioned from Colossians 2, which is our, our, our scripture. I'm going to read it pretty soon too, but it's our scripture to kind of frame our year. But Colossians 2 says that we're already filled in Christ, and that is 100% true. You are already filled in Christ. But like that analogy I used a couple years ago, we're, we're filled in Christ with this million-dollar bank account, but we're digging through the trash can looking for scraps to eat. 
We have access to every spiritual blessing, access to the riches of the glory of God, the ability to be strengthened with power through the Spirit, but we access that treasure trove and live by that through faith. We have to learn how to live through faith, how to go into that million-dollar bank account. So, so this isn't automatic. The fullness of God is automatically given to you when you're born again, but living in that fullness is not automatic. Okay, does that make sense? You can have a million-dollar bank account, but you don't automatically go to it. You can go dig through a trash can. So it's there. You are filled in Christ. Colossians 2 says so. So that's there, but do you live in it? Do you live from it? Or do you walk by sight rather than faith? Walk by your own strength rather than the strength of God? So it's there. It's automatically given to you when you're born again, but you don't automatically go to it for your strength, for my strength. We, just, we still just dig through garbage cans. Uh, this is given to you when you're born again. When you've been adopted by God, you get your, the inheritance. But imagine you adopt a child, and now he's got the riches of this new family, but he just goes and still begs on the street. It doesn't make sense. That's what we do. You've been adopted by God. You have the inheritance of Christ. The fullness of God can be filled in you, but yet, even as adopted sons and daughters, we just don't, we don't believe that. We just still, we have to just fend for ourselves. But again, God's word says being, we want to be rooted and grounded in love, that we may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ. As adopted sons and daughters, if we're going to be convinced to know how to go to that Uh, that million dollar bank account, we have to first be convinced of his love. Like he really says, you can have this. I want you to know the breadth, the width, the height, the depth of my love. Swim in this. This is for you. The love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So we've got access. We can go deep. We can go wide. We can go high. We can swim in this vastness of the fullness of Christ being enveloped and overwhelmed by the never-ending love of Jesus that surpasses our knowledge. It's a love that we can never get to the bottom of. You will never fully understand how much Jesus loves you. You will not ever fully understand that. You can't. It's impossible. But the deeper we go, the more beautiful it becomes. So it's not like, well, if I can't know, why should I find out? No, because it gets better the deeper you go. And you can't ever get to the bottom of it. So we can go deep. We can always go deeper. But are we doing it or are we too busy, too distracted? So I want to give you a little, short little history lesson on hurry and speed. Uh, In 200 BC, uh, the first sundial came to Rome. The Egyptians already had them, but uh, the first sundial arrived in Rome And it changed everything. All of a sudden, they can kind of figure out how to divide their day into hours. We can get more efficient because of this. There was a a poet named Plautus, and he wrote this in 200 BC. He said, the gods confound the man who first found out how to distinguish hours. This is like our version of saying a really bad curse word, the GD one, right? He's saying like, the gods confound the man. Right, he's swearing this guy out. The gods confound the man who first found out how to distinguish hours. Who in this place set up a sundial to cut and hack my days so wretchedly into small portions? <laughs> the Romans were irritated at this new technology and how technology was ruining culture and ruining society and just making us too busy. This is crazy, right? <laughs> Can you imagine if Plautus saw us today? But that's what was going on. They're going, oh, this isn't good for us. We're hacking our days into small increments. Like, how come we can't just enjoy a day? Now we got to be places. Now we know we can't go back. So skip forward a little bit. We, uh, throughout the course of history, we go to bed with the sun. We wake up with the sun, right? But then around mid-1800s, a guy named Tommy Edison comes along, invents the light bulb, before time, so now we can stay up past the sun. So, so guess what? Now we can be even more efficient and get more stuff done, right? Because we have more hours in our waking hours. We don't have to go to bed with the sun. Before that light bulb was invented, humans used to, on average, sleep 11 hours a night up until 150 years ago. 
now, I mean, it was what, six, seven, eight hours? Right? So we're, so, but, but we've got more time now. So it's so great. This is such a great invention. Now, electricity then gave us so many inventions. Right? We used to go and spend half a day going out chopping down wood, dragging the wood back, uh, splitting it in half, going in, getting a fire just to get a little heat. Now you just push a button and magic hot air appears. <laughs> this morning it was like 62 in here when we got here. And we're like, hey, let's turn the, the heat on. These heaters are so good. <laughs> Within like four minutes, we're like, I'm like sweating, I'm drenched. But didn't have to go chop wood. All right, so we have all these time-saving things, microwaves, ovens, grocery stores, dishwashers, and they truly do save us time. We're surrounded by time-saving devices, but yet we don't have time. What's wrong? What's wrong? We, we, serious, we have so many time-saving devices, and yet we're still so busy, distracted. Where did our time go? Why are we so busy? We just, we have excess time, so we just spend it on other things, other things. We fill the hole. Now, there's a number of things we spend our time on, but I'm going to focus on another year, since this is a history lesson. I'm going to focus on 2007. In the future, History books are going to point to 2007 as being the year that everything changed. In 2007, the iPhone was released. In 2007, Facebook went public. Twitter went public. The cloud was the first became a thing. All these different things happened right around 2007. Everything changed. The average iPhone user touches their phone 2,600 times a day. And that's for the average. That includes all you boomers out there who like maybe touch your phone like five times. So millennials, it's double. And I don't think there's any data out for like the next generation, I think generation Z, I think, uh, the, like my kids' age. So we're touching our phones a lot. 145 minutes a day on average. Average iPhone user unlocks their phone 80 times per day. That's once every like 10 minutes or so. And the majority of people don't actually know how much time they spend on their phones. Like if, if you seriously like said, well, I think it's probably this, you're probably way off. <laughs> so here's a little bit of context to kind of frame this too. The average person can read 30, 300 words per minute. So in just a little over an hour a day, you could read 150 books a year. Now, you, that's, that's 400 hours a year. And you think, 400 hours? Who's got 400 hours? I'll tell you who's got 400 hours. You do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> On average, the average American is on social media 705 hours per year. And just so you know, for those of you like, I hate social media, I'm not, that includes YouTube, all right? So, so a lot of you guys are like, oh, I don't have Instagram. I'm like, okay, but do you do YouTube? You do YouTube, right? So 705 hours on social media a year. TV or, or streaming, which again includes YouTube, 2,737 hours per year on average. The average boy spends 10,000 hours on video games by the time they're 21 years old. By the time you're 21, 10,000 hours, you can get your master's and your doctorate in that amount of time. Or you can just be like amazing at video games. So you, you, you get to choose. We can do better with our time. So maybe you don't have over an hour to read, but just 15 minutes per day of reading a good book, you can read 30 books in a year. That's pretty cool. I don't know how much you guys read. I don't, I don't know how many books I read a year, but I just think 15 minutes, that's just, I could just do better with my time. That's all I'm saying. Here's the thing about our phones and devices and all these things. Uh, they're, they're like um, slot machines. The slot machine industry makes more money than Hollywood and Major League Baseball combined in a year. The crazy thing is it's just a nickel at a time. A quarter at a time. You go, how on earth could that make more than these juggernauts? But over time, just a one little quarter at a time, it adds up. By the time the end of the day, you don't realize, I just spent 50 bucks, 75 bucks gambling at a slot machine. That's what these phones do to us. That's what devices do to us. We just go, oh, it's a quick check. And again, just before we move on, I'm right here with you guys, okay? So I'm not pointing my finger at you. I'm pointing my finger at me. Right? These things, every little slot machine, we just go, oh, it's just, I'm just going to check it real quick. I'm just going to check my email real quick. All of a sudden, we don't realize how much time we've actually spent on these things. And we're fragmented through the day. 
And we don't really question technology because it's fun. Light bulb, woohoo, let's go, light bulb, right? Why would we not want a light bulb? Technology, it's, it's sleek, it's fun, it enables us. But you know what it actually also does, some of the negatives? It enables us to kind of be more like God. And that's kind of, I think, the deepest craving. We, we can be omnipresent now. We can be anywhere we want, whether it's through texting or, or reading the news across the world or VR or whatever it is. Like, we can be everywhere. This feels pretty good. We can, we can multitask. Just here, here's the deal. God is the only true multitasker. The rest of us are terrible at it, right? You're never really, you have to pause one thought. And I mean, it's, but that's, but it feels good to be able to do lots of things. It just, it makes us feel more like God. But guess what? We are terrible at being God. We're terrible. We want to be everywhere and do all the things. We have fear of missing out. We want to be everywhere. And, and I mean, you ever like when someone says, hey, did you see the new show or the new, you feel like you're missing out. You're going, oh no, that's another thing I've got to put in my queue. You have this like entertainment anxiety. Like I'm missing out on something. But church, we are limited people designed to be limited, designed to be in one place at one time. And again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying we should ban these things or anything. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying we can do better with them. We can do better with our minds, with our hearts, with our soul. Now, it gets worse, but I promise we're going to get to good news. But we've got to go a little bit deeper here because the worst part about this isn't so much the amount of time we spend on all the things. And I'm not just talking about phones or TV. I'm talking about any, any hobby, any distraction, anything you, just, you use to fill the void, anything that's getting in the way of, of really enjoying Jesus. So I'm just kind of picking on technology because it's I think, the most common one. But the worst thing about this isn't so much the time that we spend on these things, but it's how these things are conditioning us, how they're training us. We are being conditioned to be interrupted. We're being trained to be interrupted, to be distracted. We're being trained to be lured in, the tractor beam of the, the thing, whatever it is. I mean, how many times, like I'm, this is one of my most guilty things, anytime some trivia thing comes up, I'm like, oh, I'll just, I'll just Google it real quick, right? I mean, it's just, we're just instant, rather than just going, you know what, I don't know. <laughs> like, I gotta know. And I just go to the phone, because I gotta know. So we are just being trained to be distracted. We're being conditioned for that, to be influenced. I mean, they're literally called influencers. Like, that's what they're called. Those people are called that. We're trained to be influenced. They can't make money if they can't distract us. That's what it's, it's all about, money. They can't do it if we can't get distracted. The very first president of, of Facebook, if you ever saw the old movie, it was the guy that Justin Timberlake played. He said, later on, he, he, he quit, and he said, God only knows what it's doing to our kids. He said the, the main question that drove their research and how to develop Facebook was, how do we consume as much of their attention as possible? That was kind of like their driving vision and mission statement. How do we consume as much of their attention as possible? A gal named Linda Stone, uh, this quote's in your notes. She's a Microsoft researcher. She says, continuous partial attention is our new normal. Reread that. Continuous partial attention, not full attention, not undivided attention, not focused attention, that's our new normal. I mean, I'm just, I'm telling you guys, I'm preaching to myself right now. The last few years, I feel like this has become my new normal. Every time we go online, we jump into a world of interruption technology, technology that is built to interrupt your life and get you to go off into other things. And so now we're, as people generally, we're fragmented, we're distracted. Some research shows that even just having your phone in the same room even if it's turned off, you're distracted by it. Because you just, you wonder, I wonder if someone is trying to get a hold of me. Oh, it's right there. Maybe I should just go over there and turn it on and check real quick. Now, we want life's interactions. This is what we want now. We want life's interactions to be the same way given to us, the way that we've trained ourselves. We want all of life's interactions to be quick and hurried, little fragments here and there. Uh, this guy, Nicholas Carr, this is in your notes as well. He wrote this uh, Pulitzer Prize winning book called The Shallows not a believer, but he says this about what the internet has done to him. He said, at one time, I used to be a scuba diver in the sea of words. He would go deep into books and words and research, but now I zip along on the surface like a guy in a jet ski. That quote hit me so hard. 
I used to be able to be so much more focused and just tune things out when I would just be in the Word, be studying. But now, like, my mind just goes, I, just, I think about someone or something or whatever it is, and I'm just, I've been conditioned to be distracted, to be fragmented. I don't like that. I don't like that. So Paul, again, he says, going back to verse 18, I want you to have strength to comprehend, to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So our problem, I think, as born-again believers, born-again believers, I don't think our problem is so much that many of us are going to renounce our faith, but what I think our biggest problem as truly born-again believers is that we're going to settle on a skimming along the surface faith, getting on a jet ski. If you're a born-again believer, I'm, I'm not, I don't think you're going to renounce your faith, renounce Jesus. I think our biggest fear and concern should be what kind of faith are we going to have? Are we going to go plumb the depths of the sea, the presence of Jesus, or are we just going to be content just being distracted, being fragmented, not giving Christ focused time? So I'm going to start turning the ship a little bit here towards some good news, towards a little solution, towards maybe a plan, because... <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I'm telling you, I, I told a few guys this week, I'm just a little concerned that I've got too much of like this weighty bad news, so I apologize. I normally try to load it a lot more, but I think there's, it's not good news unless we have bad news, right? And we have to face the bad news. So we become what we behold, what we give our attention to. Whatever you give your attention to, you become more like that. And, and attention, like consider this, attention. Giving attention is the first step towards love, isn't it? Right? To, like when you either start thinking you love something, you give it more attention. Or if you want to love something, you have to give it attention. Attention is the first step even towards worship too. You can't worship what you don't give attention to. So what do we give our attention to? When we're distracted, our attention is fragmented. So we can't give our attention to our spouse or our kids because we're distracted. This little thing is just calling out to us. Now, I do think that all of us, again, I, so I'm not saying I'm not lobbying to get rid of these things or getting rid of movies. I'm not lobbying at all for that. What I do think, though, is that we could probably all do better. But that's up to you, your family, talk with your spouse, your kids, whatever. Like, that's, I, I don't have, I'm not saying, like, you got to do it this way or that way. That is totally up to you, between you and the Lord. But I do think we probably all can probably do some kind of changes that would have our life be more full in Christ. And even if you decide to get rid of all the devices, guess what? That's actually not going to fix your problem because these things aren't the problem. The problem's in here. It's not these things. You get rid of these things, you'll just find something else. So what's our solution? Jesus gives us the solution in just two words, follow me. Follow me. You want to see heart change? You want to see transformation change? You want to see your, your, your focus, your, your love to deepen, follow Jesus, truly follow Jesus. That requires, though, knowing him, loving him, enjoying him, spending time with him, having fellowship with him, communion with him, seeking first his kingdom, not the kingdom of entertainment, not being hurried when you're with him, not being distracted, undivided attention, that's the only way we change. It comes from him, not from us. Not from us trying to just discipline ourselves to get rid of all these things. That's not the solution. This is the, this is the problem. The only thing that transforms us is beholding the beauty and the depth of the love of Jesus Christ. That's what changes our heart. That's what melts us. That's the only way we change. The only way our hearts change. That's the only way we become free and satisfied and, and whole and filled Christ and his word dwelling in us. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Now, when I think of all those stats that I kind of rattled off, I'd feel I, I'm a prisoner of technology more than I care to admit. I want freedom. The word says that where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Not Wherever you're, you, whenever you're super strong, you're super disciplined, then you have freedom. No, no, no. Where the Spirit of the Lord is. So I want to go where the Spirit of the Lord is because I want freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, 
beholding the glory of the Lord. Remember, it's the glory of God, which is where we get our riches. So with an unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, we're being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. We're being changed, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. It doesn't come from you. It comes from the Lord, beholding the Lord, being with the Lord, sitting with Him, as Mary did, rather than Martha, who was always busy, distracted, being Mary, just being with Jesus. We know that Jesus said in John 17 to his father, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. It is the truth that sanctifies us and changes us. And I have to ask myself, what is, what's truly shaping me? What's sanctifying me? I know only God can truly sanctify. I'm using that word loosely here. What's, what's transforming me? And I don't like to admit that the phone, internet is shaping me and sanctifying a lot more than I care to. I don't want those things to sanctify me and transform me. I want to be sanctified and transformed by the Holy Spirit. I want to behold the glory of God. That's what I want to have shape me. So Colossians 2, the one that's our, our, our framing scripture for the year. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So how do you receive Christ? By grace. So walk by grace. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. According to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, according to the latest influencers, according to the news, according to social media, according to the God of entertainment. I mean, that's, that's the modern version here, right? and not according to Christ. See to it that you are not lured away and distracted by all those things and not by Christ himself. For in him, in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily and you have been filled in him. You've been filled in Christ, who is the head of all rule and authority. So church, if, if, you're, if you're feeling stretched thin, you're feeling overwhelmed, exhausted, burnt out, busy, distracted. This world is, is hard to keep up with. If you're feeling like you're not just close to the Lord or just your relationship with the Lord just isn't deep, Jesus gives us good news. He says in Matthew 11, come to me, come to me. All who labor, and you're heavy laden. If even just hearing these stats, you're going, oh, I have a bigger problem than I thought good news is that Jesus says, come to me. Is that stressing you out? Is that bringing some anxiety? I'll give you rest. I'll give you what you need. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me. because I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. I think we all want rest. And I also think we all want to be strengthened with power through his spirit in our inner being. I think we all want that. But are we willing to do what it takes? Do we just want the results, but not the process? Are we willing to come to him and follow him? Truly follow him. Abide in him. Slowly. Slowing down our lives. Slowing down our time with Christ. Undistractedly be with him. And, and again, I, I know this is so hard to do because we've been conditioned, we've been trained. And there's real things. There are kids and there's responsibilities. There's all the things that we have to give our minds to. Those things aren't bad. So I'm, I'm saying this just from a, not from a place of judgment at all. I am right here with you. These last few months have been real hard for me. The last 18 months have been the biggest challenge in my mind that I've ever had. I want, I need more Jesus. I need to go deeper with Jesus. And I, I want you to want that too. And I want to do this together as a church family. I want to do this together that we would just, throughout our week and the next few months, we would just be amazed I, I, and I know so many of you want to too. I, I, if we can do this as a church family where we look back and we go, I can't believe the last three or four months how much deeper we've grown in Christ. That's what I want. And I want you to want that. And I want to do this with you because I'm in the same boat as you. I want to be built up in Christ. All of us built up in Christ. 
for us to know the depth, the height, the breadth, and the width of the love of Jesus that surpasses all of our knowledge. Church, we can do this together, and we'll never get to the bottom of it. We can journey on this together. We can live from the riches of his grace and have rest for our souls and our minds, no matter what's going on out there. No matter what's going on in the world, our personal lives, it doesn't mean those things go away. It just means that God will give us the strength to get through all those things with rest in our souls. This is available to us to walk in freedom and joy and peace and live from a a place with peace and power in our inner being. And all of this is available to us right now. And we don't need to add anything to our lives. We just have to learn how to go deeper, how to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. We can truly grow in Christ, but we have to behold him. We have to slow down enough to walk with him, and Jesus walks slowly. That 2,000 years ago, they didn't have all the stuff that made us so efficient. Life was slow back then. He went aside to pray all the time, to be alone. We've got to learn how to do that for ourselves. So, next couple weeks, we're going to slowly kind of share some, some plans, kind of some building materials for you, your family, to build a trellis. Because your trellis is going to look different than mine. My life looks different than yours. You have little kids, old kids, you know, you're single, uh, whatever it is. Everyone's different here, but you need to build a trellis that helps vine growth so you can abide in the vine. We can't just manufacture a bunch of trellises and say, hey, Life Mission Church, we're going to do all the same trellis. Your, your trellis is going to look different than mine but we gotta build a trellis, a trellis that makes sense for you, that makes sense for your life, makes sense for your schedule, but we wanna give you the building materials to do that. So I have a little preview today, and then over the next couple weeks, we'll share more, but helping us just to have rhythms and habits of God's grace, habits to help us enjoy Jesus, to have fellowship with him, friendship with him, not just adding him to our life or adding Jesus-y things to our life, not just being a better Christian, but tools Material to build a trellis that will help us to enjoy Jesus Christ, the man, our friend. A trellis for you, your family, your kids. So now, because none of this, there's no formula to discipleship. Discipleship is very inefficient. Relationships are very inefficient. Right? You want to go deep with someone, you can't just have deep conversations. Sometimes you just sit around and watch a ball game. Other times you have deep conversations. Real discipleship is very inefficient. It's very messy. Sometimes you feel like you're going backwards. You're actually going forwards. You just didn't know it, right? So this isn't a one-size-fits-all. If we just do these four things, we're going to be good. It is a slow process. It's sometimes backwards. It feels frustrating, but we just want to be facing the right direction, building our little trellis. So a couple practicals before we uh, close up, and we're going to have a lot more of this in depth in the future, but I wanted to give you a little preview uh, for this. Main thing I want to focus in these last few minutes here is bringing attention to our time in the Word. Uh, Again, Tyler reminded us the reasons why we need this, but how do we make some of these changes? How do we go deeper? How do we utilize God's Word as not just a task, but as a, like we saw last week, a power cord that connects the drill to the outlet, power cord to bring us face-to-face with Jesus? So I'm going to highlight three things today. Does anyone have a a handout notes I um, I can have? You guys can look at the back here. These are just, again, suggestions. You don't have to do any of this, but there might be something that intrigues you. But I want to focus on three primary things here. One is just simply a devotional time, preferably in the morning, but that might not be possible. Spending time in the morning, getting a good devotional uh, that it just has gospel scriptures, gospel verses, I put four here. Gospel Primer is a very short, easy, I mean, like half a page short, I mean, and like big font kind of short, double space kind of short. Uh, Really easy to get gospel truths in you. Uh, Be Thou My Vision is one that's a little more liturgical if you have a little more time. New Morning Mercies by Paul Tripp is a really great one. I know there's a hundred out there. I just, I'm just picking three here. Um, I'm soon, I actually, uh, some of you guys have a a pre-copy uh, I did a 50-day devotional because I need this so badly. I just, I'm like, I'm just going to write a devotional because I, I know what I need kind of a thing. Um, that kind of has like a psalm a day and a proverb a day and then a devotional thing. That'll, I'll have that probably within a month. Um, so that's another one. Uh, family devotionals. 
Uh, long story short, uh, 10 minutes, easy for you and pa- your, your, as parents to spend 10 minutes with your kids being in God's word and focusing on the gospel. Object lessons, really, really cool. We did it when our boys were younger. We loved it. That's a great one just to kind of have a habit. And, and here's the thing, church, too. If you're not like, don't, don't put this pressure on like we got to do it every night or every Monday or whatever. Like, again, discipleship sometimes is very inefficient, right? Anytime you're in the word, you're going forward. If you get behind on something, don't worry about it. Just pick up, pick up the next day, right? Doesn't matter. Don't let that guilt or that pressure of like keeping up with this or that. Just anytime you open up a book, you're doing good. You're doing good. Uh, so the next one, uh, and we're going to talk about more of this in the next couple of weeks, but um, reading the Bible, a Bible reading plan, having a time not just in a devotion, but having kind of a plan to be in the Word. It doesn't have to be a going through the Bible in a year thing, but just something that has you in the Word every day. Um, my wife and I and a couple others uh, started doing a chronological one-year plan, which is cool because it takes you in, in uh, historical order rather than the books of the Bible. Um, I'll say this. If you have never done a one-year uh, reading plan and you'd like to, start with us. Do this with me and Katie. And, um, and again, if you miss it two or three days, just don't, don't try to keep up. That just puts stress and pressure. Just pick up where, where, you, where, you, where you missed. But if you're interested in that, let me know because it'd be really cool if some of us... I know a handful of you guys are doing a, a plan together. So if there's anyone who's not, you want to join in on one, let's do one together. Let's do one together. Um, Machine Bible reading plan is a really popular one. If you want to go even slower, there's a two-year plan. We actually did this a few years ago that's really good. So, but the last thing, uh, and then we'll uh, close up here. I wanted to show you something. Katie and I are going to have this in the back, um, is Scripture memory. And I know you probably are saying, oh, I have such a terrible memory, but you can do this, okay? Um, having just a simple way to spend five minutes a day focusing on memorizing scripture. Um, if you are curious about memorizing scripture, we will print you out your first cards. I'll show you where to get uh, boxes, um, how to make just these little very simple um, strategy for memorizing scripture. Uh, you can talk to us after service. Uh, I've got mine. Katie's got hers, if you're curious. Um, in the future, I'll probably either, we'll do either like a video or just something after church where we can kind of walk people through it. But if you've always just wanted to have a simple way to memorize scripture, you just don't know how, we want to help you do that. And I will print out the cards for you. So we're doing the same cards. Um, our, our scripture memory on Sundays is going to be from these cards as well. So again, this is the kind of thing, maybe you don't want to do this, maybe it's not, or there's, there's apps too, but I just want to make it available to you. I just want to give you some materials that you can build a trellis. You take the materials you want that you think work for you, but I just want to show you some, and we're going to be looking at more over the next couple weeks, but I wanted to at least share those with you because we can't grow in Christ if we're not meditating on his word, if we're not knowing him and storing up his word inside of us, eating his word as daily bread. So I know I rushed through that whole section. I, I, just, I know I was getting short on time here and we're going a little over on time. Um, that's what I was afraid of. But, uh, but hopefully there's some things here that you go, okay, like there's some relief. Like I can maybe try that. Maybe that doesn't sound too intimidating. If I get behind, no big deal. I just pick up, right? just take the pressure off yourself. This is not up to you. This is from the storehouse of God. The spirit in you is going to feed you and nourish you, right? You just got to put yourself in front of him. If you miss a couple days in your reading, then just don't live in that condemnation. Just pick up the next day. Christ will work in you. You can grow in Christ because of the Holy Spirit, not because of how good you are at growing in Christ. So you just step out in faith, step out in faith. I know it's not easy. Sometimes you're going to feel like, you're going crazy. There's no way to undo your distraction, your mentality, your attention span. You, your mind can be transformed. You can be undone and brought back to a place where you just desire and crave that time with the Lord. The Lord can do this. So let me pray now and um, thank the Lord that he is more committed to our growth than we are. He is stronger and more powerful to change us than we are. And we can give him thanks for that. And we can give him thanks that he has promised to complete the good work that he started in us. 
Father, I, uh, I, I come to you as one who needs and desires more of you, more of enjoying you, not seeing my time in prayer or the word as a, a discipline or a thing I have to do, something I check off the box. I just, I want to have vibrant time, relationship, fellowship, communion with you. But I am distracted. And your word says in Proverbs 1, wisdom cries aloud in the street, in the noisy street. Everything's trying to get our attention. And wisdom's calling out to draw us to her. But we're distracted because the streets are noisy. The streets of my heart are noisy. The streets of my mind are noisy. But I want to reply and respond to the wisdom from your word that is calling out to me. I want to go to wisdom, go to your word. I want to behold the glory of Jesus Christ. So help me, help me to do that. Give all of us a desire to just take different steps, to pick up some of these materials that we're going to see over the next couple weeks and just try things. Maybe we buy one devotion, we don't really like it, we, just, we try another one, we don't give up, we just keep going, we just keep building and perfecting this little trellis, knowing that the trellis is going to change over the years. But we want to build a trellis, we want to abide in the vine and see the vine flourish in our life. So God, give us patience. I know I get antsy and I just want change right now, uh, but change is usually slow, so Give us patience, but give us an excitement and a desire. Just take a few steps. Make a few changes. Try a few new things. We need your help, Lord. So Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us. We thank you so much for this day. We get to be together. And it's in Jesus' mighty name, amen.